Ranch's local government at work. Our guest today is Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador CEO Rob Nolan. Rob is passionate about municipal affairs and governance, serving on the board of directors for Happy City St. John's from 2015 to 2020, including two years as chair, co-founding the municipal advocacy group Citizens Assembly for Stronger Elections in 2017, and managing and advising on multiple municipal campaigns throughout the province. Rob holds an MBA and Master's of Arts from Memorial University and a postgraduate certificate in public policy and governance from the University of Victoria. During his Master's of Arts studies in political science, Rob completed a thesis on local governance in Newfoundland and Labrador. Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador, or MNL, formed in 1951 to represent the interests of the growing number of municipal councils in the province. Today, there are 276 incorporated municipalities representing 89% of the provincial population. With that, Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I want to start by asking the general overarching question that we've used on a lot of these episodes, and that is, can you provide a brief overview on the current state of municipalities in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador? Yeah, it's a great question to start on. Um, so our towns and cities in Newfoundland and Labrador are, uh, we would say, doing the best with what they have. So you mentioned in um, your intro that there's 276 municipalities. We have a province of 540,000 people. So that's a lot of uh, municipalities for our population. And that's not accounting for the over 100 uh, local service districts and unincorporated areas in the province. Um, so we have 78% uh, of that 275 um, that have below 1,000 uh, people in population. Most of those have uh, one town clerk, and often it's the case that they're part-time. So that would look like a town clerk that might work two afternoons or two mornings a week. Um, uh, so our municipalities, for the most part, are very low capacity to uh, address their needs. Um, but they do the best with what they have. You know, our town leaders are doing great things for the residents. Town leaders and town administrators are dedicated and passionate about the work, um, but they're they're dramatically under resourced um, in our towns. Um, so we've been advocating for a new fiscal framework um, to address that over the last few years. Um, and Chris, I know you've had a few people on that have talked about FCM's municipal growth framework. Um, so we're looping into that discourse as well to try to leverage um, that conversation. Um, there are challenges here, just like the rest of the country, just like you hear on the show all the time. Rural areas continue to see shrinking populations. Our uh, St. John's metro area is the only area of the province, really, that has a growing population, a projected growing population. Um, and with that comes um, shrinking tax bases. And our towns, of course, like the rest of Canada or like most provinces in Canada, rely on property tax. So as you have a shrinking tax base, um, it's shrinking finances uh, for those communities as well. Um, and that doesn't mean that the costs and ex expenditures for those towns go down, right? We have an infrastructure deficit, um, greatly aging infrastructure across the province. So those costs, for one, are only going up while uh, the revenues are going down for our towns. So um, so our towns are, are low capacity and, and uh, strapped for resources at the moment, but they're doing their best and we have some great leaders in those towns that are, uh, you know, working together to try to, and working with us to try to find solutions. Now, I, I always prepare a list of questions going into these type of interviews, but my, our guests usually say something and then we get diverted off the prepared question list. You talk about the new fiscal framework. Uh, FCM's been calling for that, MNL. Uh, President Cody, uh, I spoke with her at the FCM conference and she is sort of in line with what FCM, but they're calling on the federal and provincial governments to come to the table. Has MNL had that conversation with anyone in the provincial government yet to date to say, let's have this conversation. We need to work together in that trilateral format. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've been in this role since December of uh, 2022. So just over a year and a half. And Craig, who's on the line, was my predecessor. Um, 
And we both had uh, over the years conversations with provincial government. Of course, ministers have changed over that time and uh, and parties have changed over that time. Um, but more recently, we've had conversations and, and are having conversations with Minister Haggy, um, our Minister of Municipal and Provincial Affairs, um, about the fiscal framework. Um, I presented to the table of uh, provincial and territorial municipal ministers last week, actually, and uh, FCM's president was also presenting. And a big piece of the conversation there was this idea of, of a new fiscal framework, what that could look like. Um, often the conversation, or I, th I think a lot of the focus of the conversation has been around um, sales tax and a portion of the sales tax being able to go toward municipalities. Um, M&L had a report done by Dr. Wade Locke um, about 10 years ago that really focused in on that. Um, so that's a piece of the puzzle. That's a piece of the conversation. Um, and the minister has shown interest in delving into that. Um, but there's there's other other pieces of the puzzle as well, um, you know, not the least of which being uh, right now we have a framework of municipal operating grants that um, municipalities get funding each year base plus population, essentially. Um, and, you know, we really need to dig in on that um, because it was over a decade um, up until last year, it was over a decade since um, we had had an increase and we advocated and successfully got an increase. Um, but, you know, it shouldn't take a, every decade M&L going to the province saying, hey, it's time, inflation has gone up by 17% and we need to, to meet that. Um, we need to have a formula in there so that it increases um, gradually, you know, so it's not as much of a shock to the province either when we go asking with our hands out. Um, so there's, there's the bigger conversation around how the feds and the province need to work together around taxation and those sorts of things but there's also just kind of formulaic and and uh and program um items that we can work on with the province in in that conversation so thanks rob you you mentioned uh, you know that that sort of answer was mainly around fiscal framework and and revenue but there's a lot of moving pieces just within that. I think lots of people will say, oh, you're working on that revenue file. Well, that revenue file, as you well know, is multiple issues and multiple files. And that's not the only issue you're working on as, a, as an association, as an advocacy organization. How do you prioritize which issues to address? You're working with a really wide base of members. Uh, a lot of them are quite different from one another. Lots of overlap, but a lot of differences. How do you and the board work on prioritizing that? That's a great question. And, uh, and you know, Craig, that's a conversation that we have internally all the time. You know, 276 municipalities, um, the smallest is under 100 people, the largest is over 100,000 people. So very much competing priorities within that set. Um, so it can get difficult when you get, you know, when I get a call from a mayor or a counselor saying, why aren't you focusing on this specific issue for our town? Um, but we're guided by a strategic plan that, um, that you know, was started by you and, and, uh, and finalized by me as I, as I started in the role. Um, that sets out our strategic advocacy priorities. That's something that is always a touchstone for us. Um, and it sets out three years of advocacy um, and programs and services in there. Um, and then we also have resolutions come forward um, from our members. So that's the same process that FCM uses and all other PTAs. So, um, and that's a big piece of the conversation. I think when an individual comes forward and says, our town is experiencing X, Y, Z issue. Often we know of other towns that are experiencing that issue and it fits into our strategic plan and we're already doing advocacy in that area. Um, but it might be the first time we're hearing about it when we get that call. So in those instances, it's, um, I think it's important to put it back on the town to put a resolution forward. Um, you know, in meetings with the minister or in meetings with the department, we can bring that up that Holy Road is experiencing this issue or CBS is experiencing this issue. But it doesn't become a focus of our advocacy until it's approved by the membership, because you have to have you know, with that many members, you have to have a, a mass of uh, a critical mass of the members that want that issue to be addressed. That doesn't mean that all of our issues are affecting all of our members or even a majority of our members. Um, but at least it means that we as a membership association are listening to our members as to what our priorities are 
we have a team of nine right now. We had a team of seven until our new uh, housing capacity building staff. So, uh, you know, we have low capacity too, just like our towns. So we really need to be strategic about, about what issues we focus on. Absolutely. And you have been doing a lot of work. You have been uh, covering a lot of ground with the Strat Plan, covering a lot of ground in terms of um, moving specific files forward as opposed to trying to be everything to everybody, which you know is the whole point of a strategic plan, that you're not everything to everybody, in which case you're nothing to anybody. Um, but I'm interested in what ways you've been successful. You mentioned that you got an increase in the operating grants, the municipal operating grants, which is a legit big deal. I mean, that, that was a long time coming. Uh, and your point about the fact that, you know, there should be a more robust formula that actually moves with the times as opposed to relying on an M&L showing up every 10 years, banging on the door saying, can you please increase this or change this? I think that's a, it's a great point to make. But what other successes have you had recently supporting municipalities and all of their sort of unique challenges? It's interesting because our biggest successes, you know, over the last year and a half um, really stretch over multiple priorities for us. I think they all touch on fiscal stability, because if you're dealing mm -hmm. with um, funding directly, obviously, is within fiscal stability. But then um, everything else that a municipality does, either we need to be working toward fiscal stability in order to meet their needs or meeting their needs helps with the overall system of fiscal stability. Um, so the MOGs is, is a big one that we were proud of. This year, we advocated um, jointly with PMA, Professional Municipal Administrators Association, and uh, Newfoundland and Labrador Fire Services Association um, to get an increase to uh, funding for municipal fire departments. And that one's one that, that might seem a little bit, certainly not for you, uh, for either of you, I'd say, but for some people listening, it might seem a bit out of the municipal realm, but um, our fire departments in Newfoundland and Labrador are run by, uh, or they're under the municipalities, um, and most of them are volunteer fire departments. Uh, for over a decade, this is another over a decade issue, um, they received the same funding um, for outside of municipal boundaries calls. So that might be often, that was highway collisions um, that they were responding to that were outside of municipal boundaries. We know that, uh, and we were able to, to show from, from run, running the data that um, highway collisions and outside of municipal boundary calls um, have gone up dramatically over the last 15 years or so. Um, they, they are more often and more acute um, in terms of, of what's going on. Um, and they cost more. So just, you know, just the cost of diesel for the fire trucks has gone up dramatically in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, and we hadn't seen an increase in the funding, which meant that municipalities had to backstop that. So when it, when the costs went up and fire departments had additional costs from um, responses outside of municipal boundaries, the municipalities just had to find it in their budgets in order to pay for that. So uh, we worked uh, with multiple departments um, to advocate for an increase to funding in that. We got it. Um, we got an increase in uh, municipal training funding this year. That's another one that hadn't been um, increased in another in a number of years, while travel costs and and the need for training um, had dramatically gone up over the last few years. Um, that was it's a big one. And, and again, links to. <laughs> is that Mickey Mouse telling us what time it is? It is. <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> And uh, so that was a big one. That's another one. That, that's why I say crossing over um, multiple strategic priorities because, um, you know, training is really important for uh, strong governance in municipalities. Um, but allowing municipalities to afford that training is part of the bigger picture of fiscal stability and training councils and administrators in financial management is part of the bigger picture of fiscal stability. Um, another win would be um, wastewater systems effluent um, amendments. So reopening those amendments. Um, and that has been a big challenge for uh, municipalities. I think there's about 100 municipalities still in our province that uh, don't meet the wastewater systems effluent regulations. So that means that they're essentially pumping wastewater sewage 
out into the ocean at varying levels of, of filtration. Um, and we're working on that one. That's that's a, certainly a focus of ours over the next little while also. Um, and then another win would be, um, I mentioned the housing capacity building officers that are new staff on our team. And uh, and we worked to get funding from ACOA um, and uh, immigration, population growth and skills here in Newfoundland and Labrador to get two positions that will work directly with municipalities um, to get funding related to housing. So we saw with the housing uh, accelerator fund, the half, um, we had maybe a dozen out of our municipalities. So that's a dozen out of 276 that uh, put in proposals for the half. And we maybe half of those, half of the half applications <laughs> uh, got approved, uh, got the funding. Um, and most of the challenge there was just capacity, both capacity yeah. in terms of um, being in a state of readiness, as our director of advocacy, uh, Dr. Dietra Walsh likes to say, being in a state of readiness to apply for programming when it comes down the line from the feds or the province, but also just filling out the applications. If you have a town clerk who's working two afternoons a week and is dealing with the administration of a town, how are you supposed to, first of all, know about a program? Second of all, collect all the information and then actually put in an application. It's impossible for some of these some of these towns to reach on that. Um, and you know, as we know, the housing crisis and issues with housing and homelessness are affecting all scales of municipalities. So these two positions that we've hired um, are a big win and and a big move for us that they're going to work directly with these municipalities to make sure they're in a state of readiness. So that means doing housing needs assessments, collecting data, other things. And then when programming comes down the line related to housing, um, they're going to be able to help those towns reach on that. Um, and that's direct housing programming. So the half, for example, um, but it could be other types of programming like infrastructure funding that we know is required in order to build out, in order to develop in these towns. Um, so that that's a, that's a big one for us, I think, a big priority, but also something we're really excited about. And that one's really interesting to me, just if I could jump in for a sec, Chris. Uh, Rob, you and I were just at the Atlantic Mayor's Congress, where the focus was, I mean, there's lots of things talked about, but the focus was on housing uh, for the most part. One of the things that struck me is this sort of sense from municipal leaders, whether it's elected uh, or staff, administrators, professionals, and provincial and federal folks, that traditional roles don't seem to really matter right now. We just sort of need to get work done. And we need, maybe we need organizations doing things that they hadn't done before because not unlike COVID, and I'll probably regret that comparison, uh, we did things that just needed to get done. I, I have a, I get a sense that that sort of feeling is pervasive in the sector right now as well. So m &L is being called upon to assist municipalities in a way that maybe you wouldn't normally have been expected to, but this, we're not calling it the, the housing crisis for no reason, right? Yeah, I think that's a really good um, point. You know, it's an all hands on deck kind of situation and it hasn't necessarily been easy to get there. Uh, you know, the COVID crisis, uh, COVID pandemic is an interesting comparison because I think that was much more obviously a crisis that was in front of everyone's faces, right? Um, while housing, it's taken a little bit of time for us to, um, dig into the conversation. And I think m &L for a little while, um, maybe the other PTAs, our, our sister organizations as well, we were a little bit ahead of the eight ball or a little little bit um, ahead of the curve on, on the conversation. Um, you know, and then we did a research project recently with Choices for Youth to uh, better understand housing and homelessness in rural parts of the province. Um, and we've been having housing sessions at all of our events, at our symposia, at our conference. We've very intentionally been having that conversation because we've recognized it's been an issue for a while. Um, many of our municipalities have recognized it, but Craig, you know, not all the municipalities have recognized um, the housing crisis or homelessness because often um, homelessness is invisible in your community. Um, and in Newfoundland and Labrador in particular, people, you know, Josh Smee, who's now ED with Food First, would often say um, people were given a bus pass to get into St. John's because the services for people who were unhoused 
were in the city and rural communities just didn't have those services. So they were losing community members um, because they didn't have the housing and the supports for people. And that's something I think that has really caused a focus in many of our, our towns and with our leaders in rural communities, the recognition that they're going to lose community members just because they don't have ho housing for for the community members. Yeah. Um, so it's it's been a it's been a, an ongoing conversation, but I think you're right that it's snowballed, um, and you know potentially unorthodox or untraditional organizations like ours are um, at the forefront or engaged with it. Um, but it's snowballing into more and more recognition and and all hands on deck in that conversation. I'm, I'm going to jump in if you don't mind, and hopefully, if you don't mind, Rob, and I apologize for asking this mid interview, but hopefully, you have an extra five minutes because I have two questions I want to ask, and they're important questions because we are a year and a bit from the next municipal general election in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. And I'm asking this question, we're recording this interview a day after a nomination for a by-election just closed in your province in a town called Whitless Bay, where not one person put their name forward to run for that by-election. Um, is MNL seeing any apathy around stepping up from residents and wanting to run in the municipal sector? Because 10, 15 years ago, you would see an abundance of people on that ballot, but it is slowly shrinking to a smaller, unless you go to St. Paul's uh, by-election in Toronto, the federal one where there's 87 people running, you don't traditionally see the amount of candidates on the ballot municipally that you did 10, 15 years ago. Do you see that as CEO of MNL? And how do you, as the organization, try to address that issue to get people more involved and interested in putting their hand up and on that ballot? Such an important conversation that I think we have on a daily basis right now. Um, I would push back against the suggestion that this is a really new issue. It's certainly worsening. Um, but I wouldn't say, and, and Craig, correct me if I'm wrong, since you were in this role then, but I wouldn't say 10 to 15 years ago, it was a whole lot better. We were still experiencing a great deal of acclamations um, on councils and a concerning number of vacant seats um, across councils. Um, you know, at least within the last 10 years, you were certainly um, seeing that. Um, voter turnout um, in local elections, uh, you know, we seem to hover around 40%. I think. Um, so it's it's typically quite low, even just in terms of voter turnout. Um, so interest is low, um, and and there are uh, mounting problems that is getting worse. You know, not the least reason being that we have the oldest population in Canada, fastest aging population in Canada. So people are just a lot of people in communities are aging out of being on council or or running for council. Um, there's can I also interject there for a second? Can I, can I interject yes, please, there for a second? Yeah. Because um, I, I forget the name of the community, and you guys probably know this off the top of your head, but there was an 18-year-old just elected through a by-election literally this year or a claim to a by-election seat. While you're talking about aging out, are you seeing more youth trying to get involved in municipal politics? Because and I hate to say it this way as the municipal advocate and as the municipal show, but traditionally people look at municipal politics, municipal governance as stepping stones to a potential political career provincially or even federally. Are you seeing more people, yeah. more younger generations saying, I could be a counselor and I'm 18, so why not put my name on the ballot? I hope so. I, I, I think so. You know, anecdotally, I think yes. Um. The 18 year old, I think, was Fairland, maybe Craig, or it was um, it was in an area around St. John's. Sure. I, would, I would I would point out. I'm going to I'm going to look young... it up while you talk. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and uh, and cut out uh, cut out what I said if it's wrong. But um, but I believe it was in the it was in the St. John's metro area, which which also affects things, right? It's a younger population. You have uh, post secondary students. Um, and we've had a number of post-secondary students run and get elected for councils, which is fantastic to see. Um, it is a little bit unique in that um, it happens around the uh, communities that have post-secondary institutions, I, I think. 
Um, I I hope that um, we see younger um, folks running for councils. We certainly uh, are putting effort into it. So we have a youth youth committee, um, um, uh, a youth committee of the board of directors um, that has counselors and administrators who are either you know young by age or young at heart, but certainly want to get more youth um, around the tables. Um, and last year we started, we had our we had our first um, youth simulated council uh, debate at um, our conference last year. And we're gonna do the same thing this year. Um, and that's meant to get high school students and post-secondary students, um, you know, more excited, like you're talking about, uh, about running for local government. Um, we have a make your mark um, campaign that we run um, in the lead up to elections. And the intent behind that is to, first of all, encourage more people to run for councils, uh, but also get more diversity right across the board, all types of diversity uh, around the council tables. Um, and that's been a that's been a successful campaign. That's something that we're doing. But you're right. You know, local government is um, low engagement from voters. Um often you know low voter turnout um and and it's the left it's the order of government that most often um it depends on name recognition right uh, ultimately how many signs you get out or do people know you in your community or whatever it might be um and that can be daunting if you want if you you know if you're a smart person with bright ideas innovative ideas for your community but you don't necessarily um have the network going into that, it can be really intimidating um, going into that space trying to run. Um, but we want to put it out there that anyone who's interested, anyone who has great ideas about local government, anyone who you know is excited about municipal politics, wants to make a difference in their community, this is a great way to do it. And uh, you know, I think the three of us really think that um, local government is exciting. And, and I know the nine people here on our team um, are passionate and, and find it exciting. So it's just about you know, getting that message out there that that this is the real way to make a difference in your community and, and you know, sitting around the council table can be exciting and can give you a real opportunity. So I'm astounded before... every time a budding politician, sorry, every time a budding politician picks federal or provincial over municipal, I sort of sit back and scratch my head and I go, why? Why? <laughs> all the action, all the cool stuff is at municipal. Sorry, Chris. No worries. I just want to clarify because I found the article. So it's the town of Bull Bay's counselor, Ethan Williams, was acclaimed at 18 years old on October 11th, 2023. So uh, last October, yeah. he put his name for it. And I think he was still going through university at the time. Yeah. I remember following the story and it was an interesting one. So that, that's yeah. that's who I was talking about when I said 18 years Bay, old. So. Bay, Bay Bulls. And yeah, and yeah. so that's um, within, you know, driving this. That's very close to St. John's. So I would put that in the category of that's not taking away from uh, from his win and, and the fact that he's 18 getting elected to a council. Um, but there's a lot more young people in the St. John's metro area, let's say. Um, and he was, you know, I believe he was doing a political science degree. So he's more engaged and, you know, excellent person to have around uh, the council table. And, and yeah. there have been a couple of young people kind of under 25 who have been elected within the last few years um, in the region. And, and it's just really exciting every time you see a young person come forward exactly for the reasons that you've talked about, Chris. So we have two last questions. I'm going to throw it over to Craig for one last question, then I'll do my last one, then we'll wrap up. Well, I hope I don't steal your last question. Um, that could get awkward. It's this whole show, Chris's whole purpose in doing this is to keep looking forward, seeing where we're going, finding you know the right path, an optimistic path forward. Um, with that in mind, where do you see the municipal sector in Newfoundland and Labrador in the future? Like if, as a strategic planning guy, if I was to say to you, we're in a visioning exercise now, mm -hmm. and you're responsible for the entire municipal sector, <laughs> what's your vision 20, 20 years from now? What does it look like? It's a big question. Uh, um... <laughs> Capacity, as as we've talked a little bit about, and we started talking about capacity is sector capacity is the biggest challenge, in my opinion. Uh, not just my opinion, it is the biggest challenge. You know, wh whether you're talking about human resources, you're talking about finances, you're talking about population, any of that um, capacity is the biggest issue. 
how do we overcome capacity um, issues? You know, um, we don't have control over whether people are going to be moving into these communities. We can help make them more welcoming communities. We can do work, uh, you know, to to try to try to get more immigration. But you know, that's on the provinces uh, and the and the feds' uh, responsibility. Uh, what we can do is help communities work together to overcome their capacity gaps together. Um, so, you know, up until last year, MNL had a big push on regionalization and regional government as part of that. I'm still a firm believer that we need uh, strategically, we need a formalized regional structure um, because it can't be done ad hoc. You can't depend on the volunteers, mostly volunteers around or unpaid counselors around the tables um, to do it because you have, you know, you have a few mayors um, in a neighboring um, area who really want to work together. They do great stuff. And then an election comes, a couple of the mayors um, get overturned and the new mayors might not want to work with the neighboring uh, communities. And if it's ad hoc, yeah, that's baby out with the bathwater, right? Um, so we continue that conversation. In the meantime, current government, current provincial government has uh, explicitly said they're not moving forward with regional government. So we as MNL have to figure out how do we support our members to work regionally. Big piece of that is in the regional economic development space. Um, so we're looking for, you know, regions of the province, um, projects, pilot projects right now um, uh, for the next year to two years. That's That's a priority with that. Um, where there are neighboring communities that want to come together under a formal structure to do regional economic development. That's not just up to the towns, but uh, you know, multiple organizations are working on that. I would like to see longer term that there be formalized structures in place for regional economic development um, for the communities. That helps with all of the challenges that we were talking about, right? The human resource and labor market piece, the population and immigration piece, um, as well as the finances piece for um, the communities. Um, and I think regional collaboration in general. So there's the re there's the economic development piece, but then there's also the things that are much more obviously under jurisdiction of the provinces or of the uh, municipalities and towns um, that many small towns right now just can't meet the basic services that they're meant to provide. But if they band together as three or four communities neighboring each other, um, then they could hire a resource or they could come together and put those resources together. Um, right now, in the absence of a formalized structure, um, I want us to be working with uh, communities to focus on that regional approach as, as has been the language of MNL for a few years. Um, but how do we, you know, have some case studies? How do we have some pilot projects where we can say, okay, this group of communities in Central four or five communities came together and solved this capacity gap. Now we know that that's replicable and we know it's scalable and we can move that around the province and say, hey, group of three or six communities that are experiencing the same type of problem, we have a model for you to use. So, and I see Craig, uh, there's a thumbs down that just came up on your screen. I don't I think edit, I did anything. I, I will edit that out. <laughs> um, I don't know if the computer's reading my mind now. It's it's the new <laughs> Zoom. It's it's it did that during a harassment uh round table I had just two days ago with uh the mayor of Torbay and he gave a thumbs up while we were talking about harassment and it just showed up randomly that he's liking harassment, I guess. So anyway. <laughs> So, so my last my hands off the screen. <laughs> there you go. My last question before we wrap up, and it's uh, it, it, uh, as Craig says, we always like looking forward. Um, MNL is getting together in November in Gander, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Now, for me, that's going to be a lot easier to get to than St. John's because I will not have to type in St. John's and wind up in New Brunswick like I did last November when I tried to attend the new anyway. <laughs> With that being said, uh, <laughs> do you get excited when municipal leaders from across the province come together and discuss these issues? Because during COVID, we always heard that Zoom is great, but meeting in person and actually having that in-person dialogue is so much better for yourself as CEO. Do you get a sense of pride when you see the group of municipal leaders from across the province come together and talk about issues that are prevalent to them? Absolutely. It's certainly reaffirming for all of us. And, you know, 
we get excited by the energy and the excitement in the room. We keep hearing from our members that they, uh, you know, they love the sessions, they love the organized um, uh, pieces of the agenda, but they also want more networking time. You know, they just want to get in a space and talk about their experiences. And that's broad. That could be, you know, back to the regional conversation that could be talking about uh, gaps in what they're able to do and, and finding out how other towns have overcome those gaps. Um, but it could just be, you know, experiences as councillors, as mayors, um, and many of our councils, you know, are rural, remote, northern, coastal. So they don't always get to get together with other councillors and mayors um, because of distances between those communities or or whatever it might be. Um, so getting them in a physical space together for a conference, just like our other in-person events, is always really exciting. It's always really reaffirming. And you can be sure that as you're going around and as I'm having conversations with our members, something's going to come up that's going to hook us and make us think either, oh, we weren't aware of that issue or we were aware, but we weren't aware of how acute it was or or how how much how many of our members are experiencing that challenge. Um, so you're right, you know, Zoom meeting, Zoom check-ins, they're great. It's it's a great solution, and and I really lean on it um, for for some of our meetings. But just having that unstructured time of being able to go around and speak with our members, chat about how things are going around the council table, um, even like I say, the unstructured pieces of the agenda. So yes, there will be a conversation about fire services on the agenda. There will be a conversation about ATIP, harassment in the sector, climate change, infrastructure, housing. Um, but there are we also need to have those unstructured moments of just sitting down and, and hearing, you know, how are things going in your town? How are things around your council table? How are things with your staff? You know, what are you bumping up against? What's exciting that's happening in your town? Um, so yeah, it's 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 thrilling. You know, we bring together five or 600 people from the sector. Um, and that's that's really exciting, just bringing people together from all scales, all geographies across the province to come together and talk about local government. Rob, I want to thank you from both Craig and myself for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and do this. It's always a pleasure to talk about municipal issues and municipal affairs with people in the municipal sector. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me.